Welcome back, Dave. Hey, Josh. How you doing? Doing fine. Thank you much. We've got a few things we're going to be covering today across the political spectrum. Apparently, Elizabeth Warren made it a point to address the Native American uh, population. I do have a quote here from Elizabeth Warren from that apology. She said, quote, I know that I have made some I have made mistakes, not some mistakes. She actually said I, that I have made mistakes. I am sorry for the harm I have caused. I have listened and I have learned. Uh, and she went on. But that's all I got here. Uh, so, yeah, it was a direct apology in front of Native Americans. And, you know, I guess she's got to clear the palate there. Um, what One thing that pops up to me was... Like, is this just her being just playing politics? You know, it's, you know, we're getting swinging in primary season. Oh, this is something I, I haven't done. Oh, let's get this out of the way. How does this come across to you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do find it interesting that she's had all these years to rectify that part of her history. And right. then once Trump backs her into to the corner, she tries to find a way out by doing the DNA testing, come to find out that wasn't exactly what she claimed it to be. Now she's she's on the campaign trail. Then she makes a public apology, and she doesn't show up to Standing Rock in 2016, whereas Tulsi yep. Gabbard does. So I just think there's definitely some things there that don't come across convincing to me. Yeah, the timing, you know, it all just comes down to timing. And like I said, it, it, we're, we're getting full swing here in primary season. And it just seems, it, to me, it just comes off as Elizabeth Warren uh, crossing something off of her bucket to-do list that, oh, yeah, I should have done this a while ago. Better get it done now. Uh, so, it, you know, the timing really rubs me the wrong way. It's something I should have been addressed long ago. And, you know, I think this is just once again, Elizabeth Warren playing politics as she usually does. And, you know, she gets credit for it, but I don't know. The timing just feels very weird to me. It should have been addressed long ago. That's how I feel. I think the biggest message it sends to me is the difference between a real progressive versus a person who claims to be a progressive A progressive to me is someone who thinks ahead, considers things based on principle. We all make mistakes. We all do things out of dishonesty, probably done certain things that we should not have done. But it's the individual that's capable of self-reflection and correcting that, not for expediency, but because it's a moment of wanting to better oneself versus a status quo person. I feel like those individuals tend to not have the vision to see beyond their sort of self way of status quo. You know, it's just the way things are. Uh, Therefore, I don't have a a lot of reason to think beyond the box. You see, Mm -hmm. that's kind of what I get from that more than anything else. It, It Again, it's just a long string of that type of behaving as not only as a as a politician but also as an individual that says a lot to me more than anything else you think it's a it's an indictment on her character as a person yes and and i'm not saying it's a necessarily a bad thing um i just think it's indicative that she is likely who someone who won't uh, proceed initiate or change things unless she's really pressed to do so for some Mm. Uh, perhaps strategic reason or opportunistic reason, or if it gets uncomfortable or something along those nature, uh, along those lines. With with Bernie Sanders, it's a lot more intrinsic. You know, it's it's something that drives him as a human being. You know, it's part of what makes up Bernie. You know, it's his, it's principled. Yeah, no, exactly. I, yeah, it just it just seems like a, a it just comes off as a centrist playing politics, where someone who is a progressive has you know an instinctive true north uh and i don't know that i don't feel that elizabeth warren has that and i think she showed that here to us uh with this just weird yeah. timing this apology yeah you know people ask me so often they say well well josh you know you, you're claiming the diet or progressive and dave has got you know progressive in his youtube channel title mm-hmm. as well what do you mean by that and and what I'm thinking of when I think of a progressive 
is someone who is always think about how to better themselves, you know, better the human condition. But it, but it's not just about uh, looking at society and figuring out, okay, how can we jointly better the human condition? But it's looking at self, you know, and, and saying, how can I better myself? Because how can I claim, make a claim to be part of bettering society if I don't also look at how I can better myself versus keeping things at the status quo? You know, or trying to put a Band-Aid on it or try to sweep it under the rug and pretend it like it doesn't exist. And so for me, a progressive is someone who is really looking to make changes that are going to assist the person to betterment. You know, that's that's kind of the way I look at it. And I don't get that from Elizabeth Warren. I get more that she's tinkering with things, you know, not necessarily trying to make a transformation. Principles. I think you knew that when you said she has a lack of principles, of progressive principles, and it shows. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, I understand some of the progressive base wanted to sponsor a or climate change debate. Outside of the uh, established DNC debates, how did that come out? Yeah, that didn't go. Uh, that didn't go well. Um, the DNC delegates all got together for a vote. And the vote was 222 to 137 against having uh, the de- uh, the primary candidates having a dedicated debate on climate change. They voted against it, 222 to 137. Okay. Did, was there and, any reasoning from those that voted against the climate change debate? I haven't come across any legit arguments against doing this, Uh, so one has to ask questions. Okay, well, who are these delegates? Who do they represent? Do they represent corporations? Do they represent corporations and their interests? Um, I would say, I would speculate yes, uh, because this seems like a slam dunk. Um, You know, the Amazon rainforest is literally on fire right now. Uh, you know, climate change, you know, 99 out of 100 climate scientists say uh, climate change is real and it's accelerating. We have every ounce of proof. We have every ounce of evidence that this is an issue and it needs to be addressed. But we can't even get Democrats on board with talking about it. Just wanted to clarify because I, when things like this happen, concerns me in that it can create divisions among the left if we don't really understand fully what's going on with this issue. So the delegates originally had voted to continue the policy that's written in the text of the DNC platform, which is the DNC concluded that it should not hold debates devoted to one specific topic, uh, nor can it agree to request such debates by individual presidential candidates unless already agreed upon by the entire committee or, or the delegates beforehand, right. before the everything transpired. So this wasn't specific to the climate change issue. So it isn't as though they're attempting to stop any discussion about climate change, as though there's some um, you know, nefarious reasons behind the scenes to prop up entities that aren't interested in combating the climate crisis. But it's more the, the issue at hand had to do with any topic that's not already blessed by the DNC. In other words, the DNC, before the primary season even began, already decided that these are the debates that we're going to bless, blah, 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 and we know there's 12 of them. And then anything outside of that, the entire committee had already decided based upon a vote uh, that that would be a conflict of the actual resolution that was preset. Mm. That's what that was about. So it wasn't about a climate issue. So unfortunately, I feel like some of the progressives, um, maybe some of the liberals as well within the ranks are unfortunately making this into something that it really isn't. Because within the platform, the DNC is to combat the climate crisis. That, that's right. already part of the platform. I think it's going to give the impression even the Democratic Party can't agree on the climate crisis. That's not going to go over well 
in terms of yeah, trying to yeah. educate the general population, particularly uh, those that don't believe in climate change. I think it's important this, to distinguish that. Yeah, and I, I think that's going to get lost um, in in the discourse uh, it could, because it, this is purely on an optics standpoint. This looks really bad. Mm-hmm. Like, it, I mean, it just looks like they're taking a position against talking about climate change in a very serious way by dedicating a lot of time to it. Unfortunately, whoever was attempting to create this climate change debate went about it, I feel, in the wrong way because what they tried to do is they tried to leverage getting that debate through the climate change issue. It's sort of like, again, it was opportunistic. I would not have gone about it that way. Uh, It would have been just more keeping it clean to the issue. You know, we'd like to debate a certain issue and outside of the domain of what the DNC has already blessed, we'd like to lift that ban, in other words, and just keep it at that. Yeah, I I just think it it, it just feels too restrictive anyways. Like, I I know they have rules. I know they have these votes, but it's there still needs to be more time dedicated to it. And they have to show that they're on board with it by dedicating a chunk of time. You know, I really think it's the best thing to do. I, you know, they can vote on whatever they want to vote on and whatever that's, that's it. But still, it's not going to, it's not going to tide over the public. And, you know, we should be concerned that in any context that they, that they would block such a thing. Like, it doesn't look good. It's not going to be good for them. Yeah, I do think that you're right in terms of optics. It doesn't look good for the DNC, even if it isn't about climate change. I do think the question is a valid question from both angles. We think in terms of what you're saying, you know, increasing democracy and being able to have the liberty to formulate debates between candidates, that certainly can increase more opportunity for potential voters to hear the different candidates out. But on the other hand, from the DNC perspective, it might be a feeling that they are not being able to keep track with everything and have any kind of leverage, I guess, uh, and say, if you have a particular candidate that is representing your party, I'm Andrew Yang, I'm a Democrat, and I'm coming from, does Andrew Yang, does he have any obligations to that party that he's representing? It, yeah, he should. He should have some. Anyone who goes there would have considerations, uh, mm-hmm. but there should be some negotiating room uh, as well. It shouldn't just be like, oh, I need to commit uh, and pledge a blood oath to these people. Okay, there needs to be some room to negotiate. Well, I mean, certainly the vote was cast, and so the majority didn't. You know, did not believe what you're saying. You know, um, whether you agree with it or not, the majority stepped forward and said, "Well, we don't want to break that ban. We think the ban holds some purpose that's beneficial to the party." In other words, I'm saying that democracy was served in that the delegates voted and the majority said, "No, we don't want to change that particular resolution within our platform." Is the other side then going to complain and then try to make it into a climate crisis issue, you know, and, you know, use that as a talking point where it's really unfair to do that? Yeah, I don't know. You know, these are good questions. I, all I know is that I, I, I just feel whatever they're doing is not enough. And it's not enough for the public. It's not enough for the youth, like for, for groups like the Sunrise Movement, uh, where the urgency, you know, they have the sense of urgency. The Democrats don't seem to have that the the sense of urgency, uh, so ah, it's just not going to happen. It's not good optics. You know, unfortunately, we live in a country where there really is two party uh, or yep. duopoly, and so you're right. Uh, I do think you're you know you're what you're getting to. I think at the core of what you're what you're suggesting, I totally agree with. They have their interest, you know, and they're not as they don't have a, the the kind of urgency about certain issues that maybe we progressives do or the more left-leaning side of the party does. They live in a different bubble, you know. And maybe we would imagine if the progressive wing were to take over, what we would do differently? uh, Or would we try to protect the way we perceive things should be? I mean, I'm not really sure, you know. You see what I mean? I don't know how much of this is nefarious versus just human nature to protect the way you see the world, you know. Right. Well, but we don't even, we haven't even, I mean... We haven't even talked about corporations uh, at all. And and I think as a general 
read on corporations, they don't really care too much about the environment. Uh, I'm talking by and large, as a general statement. Um, so that that just has me thinking, oh, great. Oh, the corporations got to love this. They're not going to dedicate uh, this, uh, you know, this debate uh, to this one issue that would cut into their profits because regulation you know, is bad for corporations' bottom line because they have to comply with us, the public, and that could mean cutting into their profits. So from a, like, from a corporation standpoint, they love this. They love not just putting this on the back burner and, and keeping it quiet and, and minimizing the argument, minimizing the conversation as much as possible. That, I, I'm pretty sure in my assessment there. What do you think? I do think some of that sounds pretty uh, sensible, like, you know, uh, conclusions. I would add to that, the centrist Democrats, the way they perceive the world, they're so accustomed to the Clinton era and Obama era, yes. where the way to do politics was the third way, appeasement, or yep. you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. They don't seem to understand we live in a different time. You know, we live in a, an era where the people are unsettled and restless, and yes. they don't want this sort of incremental, small, you know, buy each other off political expediency interchange. They're ready for something. Uh, you know, they want a, more than a, they want a revolution. They want they're tired of this old way of doing things, and they're seeing the world around them fall apart, literally fall apart. And they're desperate. You know, we're desperate because we see the world that is and how it's just falling apart. Uh, so this is what I think also plays into it. I think that you have people that are really generation early actors Gen going X? into the ba yeah the Gen X that are you know older. Uh, maybe over the age of 45, 50, and those that are b baby boomers, you know, they they are dominating, you know, and they have always been sort of in that mindset that we have to buy corporate power. Uh, mm -hmm. it, that's the only way we're ever going to get things done. See, they don't connect to the movement of the people. They don't, they don't believe that. They don't see that. And I think part of it is because they grew up in a time – where the civil rights movement happened. They were defeated on so many levels. They were defeated by a big corporation. They were defeated by the war machine, defeated in, to a great extent with civil rights, you know, African Americans that saw the plight in the inner city and the projects. And, you know, so it was almost like a disaster, you know, and the drug war. And so they, I believe, they got into this mindset, this whole people revolution that you're talking about is a form of either A, not going to work, or be extreme. They just don't buy that. They they really believe because maybe in their own personal lives, you know, they were sort of like going to Woodstock and they were slacking and and then finally they were thirty something years old and they realized they needed to do something and so they mm -hmm. they had sold themselves to the corporate state and they got their lives together, you know, and they got their white picket fence and their car and their Mercedes and you know now they were finally accepted when before they were just looked at as hippie, yeah, hippie. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they were looked at as hippies, you know, and they were, were, weren't respected. So they went out of the way to make something, quote unquote, make something of themselves. And they they sold out their souls to the corporate state. And the corporate state, mm -hmm. okay, well, we're going to give you that $100,000 job, and you're going to be a manager, and you're going to work long hours, and you're going to do this for us, and you're going to you know, rally the troops, as we say, and how we see fit, and pay them $5, you know, an hour, and you're going to be okay with that, you know. And so that's the way they see things you know they just see the world that way they just believe that that's what gets you ahead and and the way they define getting ahead which is that you know white house white picket fence and two dogs and two cars and that's just the reality space pretty much and so people like you and i you know that are from a different time frame and younger you know that are millennials or gen z they see that corporate machine isn't working and so we're the ones naive enough to believe that if the people do something uh, then we can change the world or maybe yep. it's not naive i shouldn't call it naive but i mean i think people on the outside will look at it look at us as naive yeah we're trying to correct a lot of the damage of what they've done um so it's mm -hmm. like and they see us as a threat and they want nothing to do with us they wanted nothing to do with until nothing to do with, with us in 2016 
And then all of a sudden, Bernie Sanders' policies are all becoming major game players in the, in, in the party now. And now it's like, oh, whoa, progressivism. Yeah, cool. The key point I'm trying to make out of this is that I don't think that every time you see a person that is a centrist Democrat or right, it's what how they believe you get those things done. They think it's – they believe in the rat race. They believe that whoever gets the most money gets the most power. Mm-hmm. Then they can push the agenda. But see, it's a, it's a power struggle because then the Republicans are going to do the same thing. Well, next election, we're going to try to get more money and more power. And so they just – go back and forth with each with each other you know which is why money we just why we need to get money out of politics it would just solve so many problems right absolutely i think that's that's pretty much it now of course there's probably some people that could care less about the environment or whatever but i think for the most part you know if you talk to corporate people yeah they want to see the planet saved they want all that stuff but they just don't think it can happen unless you get you know you get the money they want it done the way they think it should be done, which is what you just laid out, like this big mm-hmm. rigmarole process thing, uh, when it really just needs to be addressed head on directly. And not it's not about winners and losers here. It's not about who can raise the most money or not, or who has the most power, who's the power player. It just needs to be addressed. Yeah. They're also afraid of losing control, you know, because then – that's the way they've been doing it for so long, and along comes these, you know, these punks, and and they're wanting to take over with their chaotic process. You know, it's like that scares them because it's going into chaos. And from their perspective, it's like there's no order to it. There's no, it's uh, you know, it's disarray. It's disorganized, and there's no one to answer to. Who do we, you know, like? It just feels like they're losing footing. You know, there's who's leading this charge? Old Bernie Sanders, the socialist. So I think that's what's going on. It's a struggle over the DNC. And um, But one thing I think is encouraging, though, is you are noticing progressives are getting more and more presence, more and more say within the DNC. You know, we changed the way they did things from 2016 to now, right? And it's still not perfect, of course. There's a lot of things, kinks that need to be worked out, major problems still. Yeah, no, that's I think – you know, the the squad, you know, it, it, there's a new crop of young, uh, diverse progressives entering the party. Uh, you know, they're set to double or triple their numbers in the 2020 election. And it's just starting. And, you know, the next is here, uh, you know, mainly Justice Democrats, people like AOC, like Ilan Omar, Ayanna Presley and Rashida Tlaib. You know, this is. The progressive Democrat is the future of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. The Clinton Democrat, the Obama Democrat, the Pelosi Democrats have had their time. They are on the way out, and we need to look to the future, and the future is progressive. Yeah, populist, progressive, uh, social libertarian. Uh, I think that's – yeah, you're right. That is the future. Really, it's going to, you know, A, a matter of time, and B, whether or not we're going to be able to survive getting there. <laughs> right. Speaking of the DNC, what are your thoughts about this four polls, two percent by recognized qualifying polls? And that now, of course, excluding Tulsa Gabbard and Marianne Williamson. Yeah. Uh, back back to the DNC and their freaking rules. It's. It's just ridiculous. Um, like Tulsi Gabbard has uh, what she has pulled above two percent in approximately twenty six polls, and only two of them are DNC qualifying polls. And it looks like she's not going to make the cut. I think the cut is August twenty eighth. Yep. Three um, days. So, yeah. So, and it's just it's just so ridiculous that she can be polling between two and five percent. In 26 polls, and the DNC has only ordained two of those, you know, and she meet and she met the 130,000 uh, minimum requirements as well, um, and I think that should be the real standard. The real standard should be the money. Uh, these polls are very, uh, you know, they have big margins of error, and they just seem like they don't really hone in on the support like the donations do. So I really, really would love to see the DNC drop 
uh, these polls and just go strictly by donations. It would just make this a lot easier. Tulsi Gabbard would have been in it a week or two ago. You know, what we wouldn't even be having this conversation. But they have these polls. You have to be two percent, and they have to be ordained. Uh, by the DNC, and it doesn't look like either of them are going to make September. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think another way to go about it also is having registered Democrats maybe sign their name onto a candidate. You know, you can only pick one candidate, or maybe you can pick three or something, and then, but you have to be registered and it has to be confirmed that you're actually a Democrat, and, or maybe an independent even, uh, and then from there, they t- tally up who got the most votes maybe the top 10 or whatever can get in to the debate so there's different ways you can go about it you know i agree with you this whole uh picking certain polls is not even transparent why they pick those particular polls they all seem to be related to media in some way or another just seems a bit borderline suspicious to me you know yeah it seems like they could have they could put their finger on the scale with these polls if they like i mean there's just too much uh, there's, there's too much gray area for me with these polls, with the accuracy, because like, I mean, obviously these polls have, uh, you know, margins of error up to 6%, you know, it's just, it's just like, come on, we just go with the donors, go with something more sharper. And of the qualifying polls, only four have come out since the last debate. That's been over a month, and so the odds that she's going to be able to get two polls just in the next three days is just pretty much nil right yeah that, i mean i'm not betting on her <laughs> you know right Wait, right she did she has none at this point so yeah uh, so on to october for her yeah hopefully even then it's, but didn't she meet but hold on hold on hold on didn't she meet her hundred and thirty thousand though yes she did so of course she did so she, i mean just right there that's it if she just had it there we'd see marianne we'd see tulsi and they'd be in the debates. Yep, I agree. Unbelievable. That's uh, how it goes. Well, as it stands, there are 10 candidates that uh, met the debate requirements, uh, only two that we're interested, really interested in, Sanders and Yang. And apparently they're just going to hold one night. And they're only going to do two nights if more than 10 get in to the debate. So, again, that makes for a crowded stage, unfortunately. I would love to see them break up, you know, like, Six and six or six and five, that'd be great. Well, there's a chance that Tom Steyer might be able to get in. He's got three of the national polls, and then he's got 130,000 unique donors as well. So yeah. if they put out a poll uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and he happens to get 2%, then he'll be on the stage, and then that'll break it up into two parts. Hmm. I'm sure magically it'll happen for Tom Steyer. You know, I, I don't care for Tom Steyer, but... Uh, I kind of would prefer that he is able to get in and that it breaks it up into two different nights and then it gives more time for every, each candidate. That would be very beneficial to if if he was going to serve a purpose here would be to break up the debate stage. Uh, and then, you know, people like Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang can get more time on a smaller debate stage and pretty much own that debate stage. Yep. Agree. All right. So. I don't know if you heard that Donald Trump is considering cutting into Social Security and Medicare, and that would be one of his big goals for to get reelected. What are your thoughts about that? (laughs) Uh, Not shocking, that's for sure. Uh, But I recall on the campaign trail, he wasn't going to touch Medicare. He wasn't going to touch Medicaid or Social Security. Um, Promises made, promises. Oops. Uh, Yeah, this is just. More textbook uh, Donald Trump. Uh, I, I, I'm not surprised here at all. You know, it smells like Mitch McConnell. Uh, and, and Donald Trump is just turned out to be, you know, a, a puppet of the establishment. Um, he's just kind of like anybody else who gets in there. Uh, you know, he fights like a populist. He fights. He's got good rhetoric. He, uh, he's always a scrapper. He's always a fighter. Uh, but don't think for a second that this guy isn't playing establishment politics mitch mcconnell politics um so I, i'm just not surprised here in the least what about you definitely goes contrary to his campaign promise 45 billion cut from medicare and 25 billion cut from social security and and it, it just is words so mm-hmm. people don't look 
too far in the details on politics, Josh. Additional funds are not needed as he's going to be cutting drug costs across the board for Medicare, and therefore it's a waste of money. <laughs> that That's sort of the way he's running on. They're going to get any information outside of that is if family members inform them, you know, visit them more often, talk to them, have, you know, uh, biscuits and tea with them. I get the truth from them, and I don't need to go anywhere else. What Trump's intending to do, print it out, and then give it to them for, to read. You know, those are some of the things you can do. Yes, um, the more moderate sources, maybe. Yep, yeah, right. More the what they would deem to be okay sources. You know, that they like. They see the name of whatever on top of it. And commenting, we may disagree on some of the nuances, but if people not necessarily don't be trolls and don't be a brigade, you know, give thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, state your comments, go in there, and the more we make our presence known, you know, go into the comment section, even though it may be unpopular, you know, put your comment in there, thumbs things down that you don't agree with, and the more people do that, the more it changes the perception of what is considered acceptable. I even, I've even tried to do this too, uh, where uh, I don't e I, I even like just try to branch out on the left, like I try to, just trying to stay on technically the left, right? Okay. And I was shunned. I I got snake bitten. Uh, and whenever I've gone to the conservative side, it's just been it's just some of the craziest stuff I've seen, like without trolling, without name calling, uh, or or just it, even when I'm fully honest with them, we're we're talking from different sets of facts. It's very discouraging. Yeah, well, I don't go in there to debate people because you know, and some will take hold and some won't. You know. Um, and the more people do that, the more progressives do that, and populists stumble on points of view they maybe previously didn't stumble on. And even if they thumbs down or they make an ugly comment, I don't worry about all that. You know, just it's a different way of viewing the world out there than what they've been taught or what they think yeah, no, is true. Yeah. In theory, your theory is the chances are they've never even heard it before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or else they've only heard bad things. It's just. Mm. It's a nightmare. I try not to engage them because that ends up, yeah, you can get into a huge debate and even argument. Uh, but instead, what I do is I just correct the record. I might say, uh, actually, Bernie Sanders' proposal doesn't say that. It says this, and I leave a link. If you if you really want okay. to know, take the time to read this. You know, or I might say something like, you know, uh, if you go on a site how Trump is banning trans and you got all these horrible. People coming in there and say, well, they deserve to die or whatever. Or, you know, if I saw a trans, I'd kill them, you know, or something like that. Then I just put in something, you know, like for me, I put in a, you know, quote from the Bible, something Jesus said, or, um, or I might throw in something like statistically, you know, something about trans people. I don't engage them. I try to get into an argument or convince okay. them or persuade them. I just simply let them know there's a different world out there and remember the right generally responds through authoritarian mm. thinking you know it's like they respond to that and if it's the majority that's feeling or thinking a certain way they're more likely back down they're wired you know yeah no so. yeah that's true yeah good stuff Anyway, now I want to get back to Trump, another one that he's putting forth. He's considering uh, amending the U.S. Constitution to abolish birthright citizenship. What are your th thoughts about that? Sounds like a horrible idea. <laughs> so let's lay this out here. He's talking about, okay, so immigrants who are already natural. You're just a permanent resident, but you're not a U.S. citizen, and then you have a child, then that child is n not granted citizenship to elaborate on uh, to minimize uh, the presence of immigrants in this country, especially brown ones. We're looking at that very seriously, birthright citizenship, where you have a baby on our land, walk over the border, have a baby. Congratulations, the baby's now a U.S. citizen. We're looking at birthright citizenship very seriously. It's frankly ridiculous. And it says very plainly, all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens change the Constitution. They would have to make a constitutional amendment to get Correct. this going. Ruth Bader Ginsburg will not be able to maintain herself. She already has another tumor with her pancreas. It's malignant. So she'll get replaced. Breyer is in his late 70s. He's, uh, you know, uh, left-leaning. Clarence Thomas is very staggered. We're thinking about packing it with a 7 to 2 ratio. 
if Trump were to be reelected. And the, it might even be more than that by the time he's – well, he wouldn't do that. But um, Well, for us, when we get back in there. Yeah, there, I feel like there's some problems with that because then – What's to say if a Republican comes along and then they say, hey, let's expand the courts again. There's nothing in the Constitution. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm more for tenure, uh, along with Yang, Andrew Yang, who believes uh, a tenure, I think he said 18 years. That, to me, makes more sense. How about your, yourself? Yeah, no, I'm very agreeable to Andrew Yang's proposal, but there should be a limit. Uh, but I wouldn't mind – I don't know. I still wouldn't mind the courts being expanded, though. Um, but I, it's valid – that's a slippery slope. Like, okay, well, then each administration will just be like. Uh, yeah, I'm not totally against it, but I think that it has to be something that's very um, difficult to do again. Uh, yeah, I, it might. It, it still might take something drastic like that to to balance, uh, you know, the the opinions on the court. Because look, choice. If if these right wing ideologues keep piling up on the bench, uh, so. I, it almost seems to me there's going to be no choice because it's just going to go from, you know, five, four voting, uh, you know, to, you know, doing ideologues keep piling up on the Supreme Court. I just see that as a problem. Is the progressive movement, the populist movement, the social libertarian movement that is each passing month or, or year, is that inevitable in your mind or can a makeup of, uh, you know, a president, a Congress and a a supreme court changed that um you know like like you said our, our, our movement's getting bigger progressivism is taking off um and then you see these republicans in the supreme court these far-right ideologues stacking up see that happening here at some point if this trajectory continues uh with the the building uh progressivism going up against a supreme court that is radically right wing and that will not let us have, say, Medicare for all or whatever. They're just going to keep voting for the corporations from Trump. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on how he might respond to the people rising up? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't even thought about that. Uh, that's scary to even go there. Um, obviously, we know Trump's impulses are of an authoritarian nature. Um, so I could only – I mean, if, if Macron is – a democratic response, and look how bad that is over there. I can't imagine what an authority. Would we say that something like Portland might come to mind? Oh yeah, yeah. We were talking about Portland last week. Um, you were you were talking to me uh, something about not like people shouldn't be pushing back, like uh, something about are using violence, uh, and. You know, the, the right wing media is going to win with this framing uh, on tape saying, hey, look, they're, they're coming after us. They're beating us up. They're throwing stuff at us. Whatever. Look at me. I'm the victim. Um, but we're talking about the pushback. Like, you know, if, if a bunch of right wingers uh, who are anti-immigrant, who are notoriously fascist or have been deemed a hate group walk into my town, there has to be a resistance to that to some level. Now, I don't think it's level to violence like like these anarchists are perpetuating, but there has to be a resistance, um, whether if it's just showing up and counter protesting or whatever, because you said something to the effect that we're giving them the attention that they want. And that's fair to a degree or trying to hurt them and stuff like that. You know, it's a big media thing. It's a media opportunity. Well, their speech, their protesting. All of that's protected under the United States Constitution. Sure. The Proud Boys website suggests that all races, all religions, gay or straight. I think their objection has to do with there being a pushback to the Western culture um, and this guilt or outrage culture. And they feel – that's why they call themselves Western chauvinists. Mm -hmm. And so they – say they essentially refuse to apologize for creating, quote-unquote, the modern world. And they would like to take us back to a time when girls were girls and men were men. Read that however you want. And they feel that this controversy that's controversy that's been going on over the past 20 years has essentially been a means to shame Western culture. Again, read that how you want. Some people might read that mean to mean white nationalist or white male. Other people might 
read it to mean something else altogether, that they feel the crippled black lesbian communist has taken over the dialogue and that that, that doesn't represent the American way and that they're essentially trying to frame anyone that's against that dialogue as racist or homophobic, et cetera, et cetera. So that's at least what they show on their fraternal organizational website. Again, you can read into what you want. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, that's who they claim to be. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center claims them to be an, a, an extremist group uh, who is fervently misogynistic, anti-immigrant. Um, you know, they uh, Proud Boys showed up in Charlottesville. Um, they have members. Uh, so it's, you know, they can say what they want, <laughs> you know, and, and, and they can move where they want. Uh, you're free to move around this country. You're free to, uh, you know, uh, talk about what you want to talk about, um, even though it is hate speech in some contexts uh, or borderline hate speech. Um, but when these people show up in your town, do you stand down or do you say no? No, we don't want you here. We don't want people who are anti-immigrant, who are pro-misogyny, uh, pro just an antiquated history that doesn't really exist anymore. They want to bring back all these horrible things, make America great again. I get it. Yeah. So it, but why can't why why I'm not saying go as far as the anarchists who are you know hurling objects, bike lock chains. Uh, in aggressive violence. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about a resistance. Put up a resistance when these people come to your town. Is this a good thing or is it not? I think it's about timing. I think that if you have a group that is violent or that is starting to create laws, will start to oppress or suppress people, then in that case, you have to form a resistance to fight that back. But if it's simply... Marching, free speech, expression, protesting, or boycotting, that's protected under the U.S. Constitution. Um, sure. So I think, oh, sure. I think it makes more sense to ignore that, you know, to allow them their space, you know, because otherwise, if you're trying to create a forcible suppression of opposition, then in that instance, you become the very definition of fascism. Mm -hmm. um, so... It's better to just leave it alone and respect their space, you know, respect their point of views, respect. You don't have to agree with it. Respect just simply means you are entitled to your point of view, and um, I'm not going to interfere with that so long as you don't start to try to enforce your point of view onto me and you use violence against me or the community at large. Yeah, that, right. Yeah. So as long as well, it's peaceful, I, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, like I, I believe, I believe in a resistance. I believe if these people come to my town, I believe in a counter protest. Like, j just, just something to say, hey, you're here. I see that you're here, and I don't like you being here. I don't like what you represent. That is fine. Well, then, are you in some way attempting to? Like first off, I have to ask, what is your uh, motive, intent? What is your motive, intent? That's the first thing I want to ask you. Oh, to 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 make sure uh, that you oppose them being in your community, that they are on your home soil, that your hometown. And these people, you have to understand, these people who are marching into Portland and Charlottesville and all these other places around America aren't from that town. So it's it, it, it's the perception. Once again, we're getting back into perception. Perception is this is an invasion of people with ideologies that are toxic, pathologically racist, pathologically homophobic. Uh, some of them are hate groups. Some of them are extremist groups. And, you know, I see so I if they come to my town and I don't show my opposition to them. Then what? Then I'm giving passive blessings. Okay, you come to my town, I will do nothing. I will stand down. I will stand down for these 
misogynistic, pathological racist, come to my town, I will do nothing. No, I, I don't see that as being an option. Uh, but I also don't see the violence being an option either. But I do say, you know, if they're marching into my town, I'm going to go down there to the town square and say, no, we don't want you here. You're going to hear, yeah, you have free speech. I have free speech too. But we're both using free speech here. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand the principle of what you're saying. However, at the same time, you're drawing attention to them. Well, I mean, the attention's there. I mean, if 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 well, a couple drawing, hundred okay, so the, you're you're drawing more attention to them, is what I'm saying. Okay, are okay. Technically, yes, but the attention's going to be there anyways because if a couple hundred, you know, neo Nazis, uh, you know, or Proud Boys, or uh, whatever, whoever they are, they, they come to your town, that's going to be on the map, okay? It's going to be in the local news. It's going to be, it's already there. It's already news. So since it's already news, let's go down there and say, we're not having that in our town. We don't want you here in our town. And we're going to let you know that we don't want you in our town. We're not going to use violence against you, uh, but we are going to exercise our free speech against you and your movement. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a question of what information you believe. Um, Proud Boys seem to say they are not uh, racist or homophobic. And they even in, invite people into the fraternity that are minorities or that are gay. Andy No comes to mind. He's Asian. He's gay. Uh, now, I know some people argue that that's just a front, you know. Um, yes. That's just a prop. Propaganda. Wins. But – Sure. I guess I'm just trying to understand if you oppose them. You, so your goal is to let them know you're not welcome here and with the hopes that what would happen from that? Well, it's a it's weird because it's a, it's just a community attacking a virus. You think of it as a cellular thing, um, a virus, a right wing you know, neo-Nazi virus comes to your town. The fascist virus comes to your town. You congregate and you and you, have, you fight it in the best way you can. Um, but it needs addressed. You just don't leave viruses going unchecked. So what do you, you feel know? would be the result of having a counter-protest? What do you imagine will result from that? Well, it's on a community level is what I'm talking about. Um, the, the, the response is one that strengthens a community um, it, it's a community response. It's a very grassroots response. That is critical. Well, let um, me ask you, let's turn the tables for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say that there's a gay pride parade uh, that's going on in New York City and there's 500,000 people show up. Uh, and then there's a counter protest of, say, 20,000 people. What are your thoughts about that? Um, sure, if they, if, if they feel that way. <laughs> Um, that's, that's all legal and that's all allowed. Uh, that's free speech against free speech. Okay. I, but in terms of the effect, that's more what I'm getting at. Do the you effect. feel that the effect, what will you feel, what do you believe is the, uh, would be the effect of those 20,000 against gays having rights or whatever? What do you feel the effect of that would be? It wouldn't be. Well, the, any effect there would be for the, their anti-gay community. Uh, that's is basically what, what what I'm getting at here. Anybody in any context, you can slice up the context anywhere. Uh, the resistance is always about the community uh, on a micro level. So what you're saying is the community showing up to voice that we don't hold your views and we're in greater numbers. I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to get from you is – all right, now now that we've done the counter protest, we've made it known that the majority of us don't hold your views. What, what does that do in your mind? Like it sends out a message to the general population that majority no. of us don't think that way, or what? What? What does it, it achieve? Mm -hmm. It can, but I I just see the response is just on a very 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 small level of of saying you're not going to have this in your town. Sounds primitive, but we're not well, just going to have it. We're not gonna how, is that, how is that different from forcible suppression of opposition, going back to fascism? How is that different? Mm -hmm. 
be all there's no there's no violence going on here no one's there's nothing fascistic about how about how about coercing them frightening them or using a guilt or shame to feel as though they're outnumbered and you're not welcome here shaming them ostracizing them yeah um if they're fascist or neo-nazis i'm not concerned um that's the least <laughs> you know i mean that's yeah, I, I just feel like in terms of like um, how what you feel is effective versus what I feel is effective are different from one another. Like, I think we both have the same end goal. I don't believe in fascism. I don't believe in follow or believe in the, the tenets of the neo-Nazi party or the white nationalist party. You know, I don't believe in any of that. I feel like it's of course not. the opposite of progress. OK, um, but if my goal is to achieve a society that is progressive i think one of the tenets is to support free speech and and, and free expression and not being ostracized for different points of view true if they are not of an anti fascist if these people are fascistic or neo nazis uh but, but because, how does that how does that not fall into thought police then thought policing um I mean, I'll give you an example. If I'm walking down the road and there's, I don't know, I'm just going to use a Black Panther, okay? And he doesn't like that I'm white, part white, I'm half white. He doesn't like that. He, he hates me for it. He thinks I, that I'm scum. I'm racist just because I'm walking down the street. Uh, and he even ha he's part of a, a, a group of Black Panthers, extreme Black Panthers. I don't want to label all Black Panthers. I know there's different groups of Black, black Panthers. He would love to have his own ethno state, right? And he even has marches through the local square somewhere once a year. I'm okay with that. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care as long as you don't try to enact laws that I'm going to do whatever I can to persuade people otherwise. Now, if it gets to a point where it's getting oppressive, then that's when I feel it's time to, to push back. I don't want to draw attention to them, and I want them to be able to have – no, I don't want to get into the thought space. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think if you know what the groups are, though, um, not just some random person on the street, but if you know the groups, you've seen them in action, you, you know what they've said, you know what they believe, um, you have some sort of evidence. You know, setting up a counter protest against those people who could be fascists, uh, neo Nazis, um, and, and the like. I think that's a patriotic duty. I feel like you, you're coming from the angle of a uh, hobbyan, and I'm coming more from the angle of a John Lockean. You know, it's like you, you seem to be more cynical about human nature. Like it, it seems almost like you're saying that if we don't counter protest, they're going to infect the rest of the population because the rest of the population are going to be vulnerable. They're going to be persuaded. They're going to be uh, susceptible impressionable uh young men young, whatever yes yes the younger disenfranchised ones yes and, and you get, even if they and they're going to get caught up in the wave so to speak and it's going to create a mass movement and the next thing you know we're going to turn into germany all over again that's kind of what i'm hearing you say to me ultimately yeah if or we the don't next walmart well i mean look, look look at the damage at how one could just potentially go awry or get recruited like look at the look at the walmart shooter okay it only takes one person to get radicalized to create a micro atrocity in a community across america it just takes one uh, so why so do you like, put, okay yeah. so i have a question for you then why do you put so much faith in their capacity to propagate more than those that could teach masses of teenagers to consider a, a different way a better way like why 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 you feel they're so much more effective i don't know i feel i feel like there's too many people who are susceptible who are vulnerable mm. who will be uh you know they're disenfranchised they already uh they have a horrible state stasis in life in society and, and they're looking for someone to give them uh a lift and say that they're worth something and and, and i think we all want that in general <laughs> but it could be the wrong influence in it like i said it only takes a couple of these people to get radicalized to, to start committing atrocities it's not going to turn out like uh, you know nazi germany and, and these waves of 
uh, a, a fascist. Uh, but even if it's a couple, if here and there they're trickling in, it's enough to impact society in a deadly way. So any rising up against people like that is a duty, I believe. Now, there's one thing I will say, Dave, and again, I'm not – I do feel like we differ in terms of the approach, but, you know, we have the same go. There is one point I think you made that I think was perhaps the strongest point that you made. Maybe you made it unintentionally. Is the present just the presence of the counter protest that maybe presents an option for a teenager that's sort of teetering, you know, um, and they see, you know, they're at the town square and they see these two options. Right. And they're teetering sort of maybe toward the fascist option or the neo-Nazi option, and they see, well, the larger group of people just agree with that, and then, yeah, maybe they might say, hmm, you know, maybe do I want to belong to this group or that group? And they're looking for the sense of belonging, right? Sure. In that sense, maybe I can, I, I do see some value to just being present and being, letting the general population know, particularly, as you're saying, the vulnerable ones, the teenagers that feel lost, but no opportunities or whatever, to see that they can belong to something big, you know, there's there are options to that. That is a positive I can see in your argument. Yeah, I think I think that does make a a, a clean statement that you're you're standing up for people. You're standing up for people like that, the vulnerable, uh, you know, the the, the naive, uh, the people who are susceptible. When these people show up in your community, you're standing up for them, and you're standing up for people who don't want these people to recruit in their communities. OK, and in their, their slippery slope, dangerous ideologies, um, I just if you've identified them, like I said, like these people are identified the, the the Proud Boy, the Proud Boys are an extremist group. They're a bona fide extremist group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. OK, an extremist group comes to my town. No, I'm just I'm no, I'm not having it. I'm not. I'm going to go out and protect my community. Yeah, it's an interesting way you that you disposition yourself relative to them. The way I imagine it for if if this situation were to happen in my community is more along the lines of presenting an option, not necessarily a counterweight to, because then otherwise I'm in some way I'm acknowledging they have that degree of weight, you know, to be acknowledged. Like for me, it would be more that. If I know they're going to come through a given day, I might present a fair, um, you know, progressive fair or something that provides an option, not necessarily as a counter to them, but more as an an option to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's because you're not doing it directly in response to them. I'm more doing it as a way to suggest to the general population to let them know. Particularly as we're pointing out, the young men, particularly young teenagers, there are options out there for you. You can belong to a community, so you can, you don't have to feel like you you have no choice. It's either the proud boys or nothing. You know, there are options for you. Um, that's more like what I would present. I wouldn't present an outward sort of disgust of them or a a um, sort of a anti-protest of their free speech or their uh, whatever free expression or protest i just don't i feel like that's not that's bordering on fascism in my opinion yeah no yeah if, if that's what you believe i i still i just don't think they should have that much weight in my community where they're they're just walking in here and doing what they want when i know their ideologies are dangerous i just even if they did it peacefully like they just marched through peacefully with their insignias and their flags or whatnot and their paraphernalia and their pamphlets or whatever yeah uh yeah and that <laughs> like remember what i was talking about we, we were talking last week and i talked about the gang reference where it's like if a blood shows up on a crips territory just the simple act of showing up is a threat they usually neutralize the threat. Okay, they 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 will attack that person. Now, obviously, this is an extreme example, uh, maybe not the best example, but you get my point that just showing up is an act of aggression. They don't need to have guns. All they need to have is a far right wing.
animals are intrinsically territorial. They act when a predator or a perceived predator is on their uh, their soil, their grounds, their area. Uh, you know, humans are no different. Uh, so, it, yeah, it, but I mean that's interesting I, because I I guess I just we just have a different understanding of you know for me the idea for me at least is to progress beyond clan mindset you know it's is to transcend borders eventually get to a place there are no borders you know there are just neighborhoods you know that people collectively come together uh you know freely some people will decide to integrate some people will decide to segregate and that's perfectly okay people would just naturally do nothing's enforced uh, uh, segregation or integration is enforced you know it's just simply a state of being uh, in symbiosis, you know, we're just all living according to what feels right to us, you know. Sure, yeah, yeah, I can see that, but it, without having any pretext of these people being fascists, I, I think that, that that's kind of being, uh, you know, kind of myopic in a way where we're just turning an eye to their ideology, to what they believe. Now, I know what you're telling me, what they say they believe, what they say they believe and what they are are completely different things in my view. So if you're taking, if you're giving them the benefit of the doubt that they say they're not fascist, they're not uh, anti-immigrant, you know, and, and that's one thing, but I'm saying, I don't believe that I've identified them and it does get down to that primal, uh, you know, territorial thing where it's like, you do have that. I do have that response uh, where it is a threat on my territory. You know, my lizard brain is lighting up. You know, it, it's kind of saying, no, you're an invader here. Your ideology is is toxic, and I don't want it near anything in my community. Mm. Yeah, we'll have to continue talking on this. This is a, you know, it's it's a, it's not a uh, shallow topic by any means. <laughs> it's, it's been defining so much of humanity for so long. You know, it's been the, the yeah. great source of discontent, bloodshed, violence, so forth and so on for since the dawn of man. So we'll, uh, if you want to, we can pick up on it in a part B, C series, whatever. Um, sure. But yeah, you definitely make some great points. Um, definitely, you, too. Li- you know, I'm, I'm open to listening and learning. Um, I'll just make one last comment before we wrap up on this, uh, yeah. because I, d- I, d- I did want to, as you were talking, I did want to voice my sort of thoughts around what you were saying re- in regards to the, you know, reptilian part of the brain lighting up uh, and you know, being territorial and that's just human nature. I wonder about that sometimes. Like, I wonder if it's a byproduct, not that you're human being in so much as you are a product of what we were as human beings you see not it, it, it's not faded is what i'm saying but it's more that it's pra- so practice and so etched into the memory bank of the collective uh that um we're predisposed to see ourselves that way and therefore play out those those dialogues you know I do think that there was a time when it made sense for us to have the reptilian brain light up, you know, when people intruded on our territory or what we perceived to be our territory. You know, the dog would go pee and say, don't come up, you know, don't cross the pee line, you know. But now, I mean, my hope is that we're getting we're going to move to a place where um, this will resolve itself naturally. And it's not going to require us to have to oppose it, you see. The reason this group, in my opinion, are growing in numbers and become more present is because it understands that it is essentially fading off. It's 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 an old paradigm, right? And I just feel like, to me, and my you know, again, I understand this is my opinion. You know, that the way to allow it to, I guess. Uh, come to rest is to put it at rest by um, making peace with it, you know, and allowing it its space to um, find its sort of last leg and last breath, you know, peacefully and, and, and find something good from that. I know it's hard to imagine that, but there, there are some good to come out of that. Like, and we didn't, we talked about this a little bit in the last time we spoke, but the recording didn't come across 
you know, it failed. There's some problems with it. But uh, we'll yeah. talk, touch on uh, on the future. There's some message that we can learn from this movement, something that's they're trying to get across, something they're trying to say to us that they believe is of value to share with the rest of the human collective. It's sort of a, the last message, sort of like the message that they're leaving behind. It's sort of like your old grandfather or your old grandmother who might leave you a Bible verse and you're not a Christian, you know, um, but you can still take some wisdom out of that. And maybe 20 years later, it shows up somewhere and you say, you know what, that was actually pretty useful now that I look back on it. You know, you don't necessarily agree with the principle of it, right? You don't, not, not the principle, but what it's rooted in, but you understand the message and it, it, it gives you something of meaning and purpose. That's kind of the way I look at things. I don't, I, I think that there's a, that's why they're called the silent majority, you know. Um, there's something they want to say and they're going to say it. Whether you like it or not, you know, and and if you try to suppress it from being said, uh, it's like someone that is trying to put a muzzle on you. I mean, what are you going to do? What is going to be your response to that? Yeah, no, I see. There's some validity to that too. I do you see. Anyway, it? I guess if you like, we can certainly pick up on this. I mean, like I said, oh, yeah, it's layers and layers of of deepness. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, uh, this was the Longer Than Usual Progressive Talk podcast, uh, Dave and Josh, uh, episode 17, so thanks for listening. And again, oh, you know what, Dave, there were some uh, comments left in, left in the last podcast of suggestions for future podcasts. So yeah. hopefully in the next podcast we can maybe address some of those requests. What do you think? Yeah, oh, no, we're, we're definitely open to hear what you guys have to say. Uh about any future episodes or about current episodes or any feedback in general is good. Awesome. Yeah. So leave you guys comments. I mean, let us know what you think uh, regarding the various topics we talked about on this, this podcast today. And again, as always, thanks for listening. This is Dave and Josh progressive talk podcast 17, and we'll talk again soon. Take care. Take care.